RN2. Rewrite expressions involving radicals. Notice the strike through, it's important. The piece that's, um, that you will see um, that addresses the rational exponents, this will be taught later in other math courses. Therefore, there's a strike through in this algebra standard. So originally, we just had rewrite ex expressions invol involving radicals. We received so many questions from teachers because they needed a little bit more clarification. What does it mean? Uh, we included simplify and or use the operations of addition, subtraction, and multiplication with radicals within expressions limited to square root. And this is really helpful because this, this clarifies what we need to do in the classroom. I would like for us now to apply that standard to the task that's called visualizing square roots. Visualizing square roots is a wonderful task that allows students to understand why we rewrite radicals the way we do. This is the task that addresses the concept. Students visually see what simplifying a radical means. Why square root of 40 is 2 square roots of 10. This is a very important understanding. This is not just an algebraic way. This is not the algorithm our students will have to follow. This aha moment for students happens during this task. We added uh, questions to, um, to uh, more questions on area and things like that so that students will also practice multiplication um, of square roots. You have a handout on your desk and I would like for you to work in groups and answer the questions in the task and then we'll discuss. So we're going to draw some triangles then. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Two of those Two small, of those small ones. ones. And which is going to create the one large. Okay, the side of a large square is going to be? It's twice as long as one of the small ones, Two isn't it? Two square to ten. Mm -hmm. I want this to be... I'm having a hard time drawing that by. I'm no way. too. I'm <laughs> and then, then so if we know there's four small squares, I could divide by four and get that they're each ten. Like we've always said, <laughs> Write your answer in the simplest form. Well, what is the to determine exactly. what is the simplest form? Yes. Because really, that looks more simple. Good point. Than two on the square root of three. It <laughs> took me years of teaching to finally have that aha moment sense, this summer. Yeah. Yes. And we'll move on to the closing of our task. If you've noticed, we have not all finished the task, right? No, we don't have to. But we don't have to do it. Some of the most important discussions happen during the closing and it's okay to stop where we are and talk about what we've done. It's not always necessary to finish the whole task before you can close. There's a lot of great deal of benefit in having a discussion just where we are. As we were looking at the original figure and we were trying to find that side of the small square, we fell back to Pythagorean theorem that our students would have for eighth grade because they did a lot of work with the Pythagorean theorem. And we, we decided it's really important to tie back to that. And so it's super essential for our eighth grade students to have a strong concept of that square root factor. So we used um, back from the original picture, try to default back to that. If we could see that, making a triangle, we could measure the length and the width being um, one and three, then we could get the side of that uh, small square to be the square root of 10 using Pythagorean theorem. And then if we wanted to find the area of the small square, then we would just be able to calculate 10 as that because on a square we know that the length and the width are exactly the same and we could multiply the square root of 10 times the square root of 10 and get that um, square root of 100 or 10. We then talked about the area of the larger square simply being four times the area of one of the smaller squares so we were able to multiply that by four and then by default we could compare the side of the larger square um, to the side of two of the smaller squares, well if one of them is square root of 10 and the others are square root of 10, they're the same, two of anything would be two of that, so two square roots of 10. And then that would default us to the square root of 40 had to be the same as two square roots of 10. 
by making that connection between their square root understanding and then the concept of addition of two of exact, of exactly the same thing. So uh, let me ask you a question. So we don't necessarily teach our students here to, to simplify, <laughs> simplify right. square root. We simply teach the understanding of what does it mean. You show geometrically right. the meaning of square root of 40. Exactly. That it's two of those. That was, that was very powerful. Okay, so I took a different approach. Uh, I saw the visual of all the dots first, and so I just, I wasn't sure if the image inside was a square or not. So I wanted to see the area of all the dots, and that ended up being 64 by counting eight and eight, and then you could sort of start seeing the triangles on the sides. And so then I wanted to find the area of those, and I noticed that if I put two of those together, I get a two by six, and then I get a two by, so I get an area of 12, and two times 12 would be 24. So then 64 minus 24 was 40, so I knew that the area inside that shape at this point was uh, square uh, 40. So then uh, I cheated and noticed off Jennifer's paper that she had made some smaller <laughs> triangles and did a one by three. And then I noticed that the pattern was there that, you know, those two side lengths were the same. And so then we had four areas that were the same. So I divided the 40 by four. So I knew that inside that square was 10. And then that it, since it is a square, I could take the square root to get the side length. So that could see my two square roots of 10. So it was more of a visual approach than it was uh, algorithmic to me. Now we're going to have um, another group share their strategies to solving question number three. Paige and Jan. And on question number three, using the Pythagorean theorem we had already used in questions one and two, we, decide, we found that a one by one is going to give us a diagonal of square root of two. So we wanted a two square roots of two, so that created a two by two large square. Then the question asks for a 3 squared of 2. That's just going to create a 3 by 3. And then 4 square roots of 2 would create a 4 by 4, and 5 would create a 5 by 5. Okay, any questions? I like how you use repeated reasoning mm -hmm. right back yeah. to the standards of mathematical Thank you. practice. Thank you for yeah. that. It's, it's always good to go back to what we've been taught or what we've learned. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. And the key, oh, sorry. I had a teaching question, Jen. What led you to tilt it to the side versus, was it the opening problem? Do you know what? Yeah. <laughs> the original problem was to the side, so I just did it to the side. Now, Paige. I turned, I did it this Paige way. Paige did not. I think just teachers might wonder how to actually implement this in their classroom. So, you know, we, what is your suggestions as to how, if they're planning out the lesson and they're planning out their class, what would you do to actually finish the, because we didn't get to the back, we didn't finish the actual finish the task. Back. What would you, what are your suggestions for that? In, in my opinion, it will be beneficial to continue next time they see you. See, to me, that, would, that, ta that task is worth it. That task is worth a little extra time. The, the second part of the task takes that discovery that we have at the beginning to a new level. Um, the, the back side of the task uh, talks about some shortcuts we can take. How can we draw those squares maybe just like that, just straight, you know, straight across. <laughs> so that, that, that gives you a variety of approaches. There's an example, there's an explanation, and guess what, at the end we have practice. And it's not a worksheet of radicals to simplify, if you've noticed, just a few. But this is that, that flow that we want. Discovery, exploration, then, then find a pattern, see if you can create some shortcuts, create your mathematical learning, and then do practice. Skills have to follow concepts. That is the sequence that will make more sense among our students. I actually thought it was a more of an aha moment uh -huh. on the back than it was on the front for, which I've always used the word simplifying, but for yes. rewriting mm -hmm. uh, in a different way and them understanding what the rewriting was about. Mm -hmm. I thought that was more of an aha moment. All levels of students can do that. I, yes. I can right. tell you that, you know, because I, I was a little afraid at the beginning thinking, they're not going to be able to do this because this was a lower group. But and then I had the high group. All levels did, and they all got so much out of it. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think the, the visual, visual, the concrete? Piece. They just had to keep working through it, and they got to see it, and they 
they actually picked it up faster than, <laughs> you know, my first time going through it, I thought, what? I remember what? that. Kind of what working that just backwards, you're like, I know this, but getting, um, <laughs> it was just a light for them coming on. And then they haven't had problems with simplifying or rewriting radicals. Uh-huh. And I wonder, why do you think it was easier for them than us, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> because we were taught rules. Thank you. <laughs> you're right, you're right, you're right. We were not taught conceptually, so...